My name is Kathleen Misovic. I am the managing editor of Cleaning and Maintenance Management Magazine. I am taking the place of Jeff Cross um, today. So I will be moderating and I will be with a, a lot of assistance from our two guest speakers. We have Kimberly Thomas, who is Special Projects Advisor at the University of Georgia. And we have Dr. Gavin McGregor Skinner, who is the Senior Director at GBAC. Um, we can get started. So I just wanted to let you know this webinar is brought by uh, two sponsors, Dial and Innovo Nanojet. So, and as I said, I'm Kathleen Misovic, CMM Managing Editor, and I have Martha Schmidt behind the scenes and she's helping me um, run the webinar. So before we get started, um, I wanna bring your attention um, toolbar at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a chat um, function. I see you already know about it because a lot of you are telling me where you're from. Um, so feel free to put any questions or comments in chat. Um, after the webinar, you will receive a recording of it from email and you can watch it again and share it with your team. Um, all the participants, except the speakers, you are muted. So you don't have to worry about making background noise. Um, and we will, besides receiving this in your email, you will also find a copy of the webinar on our website, cmmonline.com. And again, um, ISSA, in addition to um, owning CMM Magazine, we have several specialty divisions, ISSA Residential, um, CHHA, GBAC, IEHA and WSA. And now a word from one of our sponsors. As I introduced them earlier, welcome to today's panelists. We have Kimberly Thomas, Special Projects Advisor at University of Georgia, and we have Dr. Gavin McGregor Skinner, Senior Director of GBAC, a division of ISSA. Welcome both of you. Um, feel free to think about what you'd like to learn from today's webinar. Um, is there a special disinfecting um, question you have, um, feel free to put it in the chat um, function. Um, we're going to monitor it and um, we will try our best to answer the questions. And your answers will help our panelists provide the best information for your needs. So the main topic of today's webinar is how to create a synergy between cleaning and disinfecting. This synergy is essential for facilities and building service contractors. Um, we wanna find out from our panelists why this is such an important goal, um, how facilities can accomplish this and some of the challenges. So I'll start off with Kimberly. Um, why do you think that it's so important to have a synergy between cleaning and disinfecting? Well, a good afternoon and thank you for having me. Thank you, Kathleen, for moderating. Um, I guess I'll start with a quick introduction and then we can move into kind of how I got to where I am and what I think is important uh, as far as how we look at tackling the cleaning and disinfecting procedures for our building's operations. Um, as a facilities, um, as I would say a leader, over the past 30 some odd years at the University of Georgia, as well as in K through 12, where I was the uh, executive director for facilities operations at Clark County School District, uh, both here in Athens, Georgia. I've always had a passion for how we can maintain healthy facilities for educational and work and play functions, so to speak. 
So that's taken me in a creative way to get to where I worked for the past 30 years before I recently retired from the university. I started in student affairs. So that allowed me to have a passion for students and, and working in educational facilities. And then I spent 14 years working in public safety at the University of Georgia Police Department. So again, that bring, brought in ideas about regulations, what are purposes, how do you write good policy, and how do you execute great policy? And I think all that kind of helped me to be able to step into a facilities operations leadership role. So um, I say all that to say that it's ex extremely important to not only have a good cleaning and disinfection plan, but to have a strategic way that you step into building that type of system, ensuring that you have training, ensuring that you have the stakeholders involved, whether that be your staff, um, the people who hold the purse strings in your business office, as well as your top end leaders, as well as your um, building inhabitants. But um, as I was saying, I think it's really important before you even get to the cleaning and disinfection to have a strategic plan so that you can know what success can look like. How do you write a plan that um, takes into account the focus of the building, the focus of the area, that you have an idea of what the customers and the building um, stakeholders really want from your cleaning team. And then making sure that you can train and that you can uh, uh, kind of replicate what that preferred cleaning operation should be. Thank you. Do you have anything to add, Gavin? Yeah, this is really important, Kathleen. I'm just going through the, um, the chat right here at the moment. The people that are on this webinar today are just from such a large geographical location it's absolutely fantastic but and i think it's really important that as we talk about this focus on synergy of cleaning and disinfection it's really important for us to you know to reflect and look at the situation that we're in when it comes to creating a healthy and safe indoor built environment that's anything that's been built and that is our role our role within the clean industry is be the, to be the managers of health and safety. So let's just reflect and think for a bit. 80% of your life is spent indoors. And if you don't believe me, keep a just keep a diary for a few weeks and just see how much time you actually spend indoors. So 80% of your life is spent indoors. So if you live to the age of 80, that's 72 years of your life has been indoors in the built environment. And it's so important that we start to move away from being subjective. That means people's opinions. I'm looking at it. It looks visibly dirty, visibly clean. And we move to more objective, which means we measure. We look to measurements. We look to metrics. We look to the ability to um, identify is the surface clean to the level of cleanliness that it's expected by us as the cleaning professional, but also the customer, as well as the users of that building. And so it comes under, you know, when we look at health and safety, that synergy between cleaning and disinfection, the process is crucial to maintaining a healthy and safe environment. And the only way you can do that is to measure the level of cleanliness. And it's so important that we do this through the lens of um, the spread, you know, you know, decreasing the risk of the spread of infectious diseases, but also allergies and allergens. Um, we look at the at also um, chemicals and contaminants in the environment, and and sometimes we we, we think you know I, I do a, I do a lot of work in airports, I do a lot of work in hotels, I visit schools, and. I was recently in a in a facility recently of a large facility. They're they're cleaning, I think their cleaning budget was about thirty-six million dollars a year. And I was helping them go through that contract and and look at the thirty-six million dollar budget, making sure that what they were spending on was giving them a return on investment, but also, you know, negotiating between the facility manager, the budget, the procurement people, as well as the cleaning contractors to ensure that what we did works. And Within our industry, there's not a lot of regulatory compliance. There is some, 
but there are health and safety requirements. And those health and safety requirements really should dictate the way that we clean and we use disinfectant. But one of the things that we didn't sort of focus too much on, say, for, for example, during the COVID-19 pandemic, was that we can overclean, we can do too much, we can damage surfaces, we can damage furniture, we can damage equipment. And so it's really important to look at that synergy, look at the processes and look at um, both building long longevity as well as the materials, the furniture, the carpet, the walls, the tables, the chairs, whatever else may be inside that, that indoor space and to ensure that appropriate cleaning processes and disinfection when you follow science and evidence can actually extend the lifespan of building materials and surfaces by preventing degradation and a lot of facilities i've you know visited recently how i've seen actual physical damage due to either uh over cleaning inappropriate uh use of uh cleaning products and their chemistries um, just that they use the wrong tools and equipment. And and so the last part, part here is how do we move as an industry? How do we move as an industry working with facility managers? And I'd even put this under the umbrella of critical infrastructure protection when it comes to airports, government buildings, schools, hotels, um, those buildings that we need within our community to function 24 hours a day, seven days a week. How do we as the clean industry take that lead and build confidence, build our reputation on what we do is, is appropriate because it follows science and evidence and it actually enhances the reputation of the clean industry. And I'll just, this is really important because Kathleen, during the pandemic, this is my hospital ID card. And on the back of my hospital ID card, it actually says that I am an essential employee. And so what that means as an essential employee that I can get through police roadblocks, military roadblocks, any sort of roadblocks, I can leave my house when there's a curfew. And the challenge we had was that so many cleaning companies, clean professionals didn't have the same designation that I have as being essential. And at ISA, so one of the big things that we're going to work on and change right now in 2024 is ensuring that the industry is regarded as essential, ensuring that the companies and the employees, the workers are regarded as essential. And we're going to work to get that done both federally and at the state level and the local levels throughout the country. And more importantly, we're working with many of our partners throughout the world and we're seeing big changes happen right now where we are becoming uh, essential. And it's, it's so critical for the sustainability of the industry. Great, um, we can probably move on to the next slide. So I think we're going to be asking, um, okay, everyone has an idea in their minds, you know, what area of your of your facility is the germiest or the worst. So um, what building areas do you think are the best place to start disinfecting? And which areas should you concentrate? And which are the germiest areas? Uh, people in the chat, please feel free to let us know. And I'll start with you, Kimberly. What building areas do you think are the germiest? Um Thank you, Kathleen. And I want to quickly piggyback off of something that Gavin said on the last question. I think one other crucial um, element to add to that is that we have to be sensitive to our staff, to our people, um, in looking at the products that we're using, what we're asking them to do, making sure that we are trying to use safe products as well. So not only having damage to the facilities, to furniture and things like that, which are awesome points, but also as leaders, we have to take in mind, keep in mind what we're using and how that impacts our staff. And that's a segue into as far as the germiest places. The germiest places that I have found have been our custodial closets. Oh, so wow. we get a good chuckle. We get a good chuckle. But I always say that the best practice starts at home. And so that's one of the things that we all focused on um, at the University of Georgia and in our school districts. What are we doing as, uh, as the facility operators? And then making sure that when we have the best cleaning disin uh, and disinfection of our tools and equipment, then that is also what we carry out 
into the facility. And then as we are working with our customers, some of the, the main places that we um, talked about as far as how we have a shared sense of success, uh, we started with our floors, our restrooms, our food areas, and then our common areas. And depending on um, what is most important um, to our customers, it could be as far as this, the number of students, as there is a, a primary function happening. If we have in our in our vet uh, veterinary hospital or some of our crucial uh, patient areas, starting in those places to look at what are we doing, writing specifications so that we can replicate our cleaning and disinfection programs so that we get success again and again, and making sure that our stakeholders know what success looks like for us so that when they're in those areas, they understand what we're trying to accomplish. Okay. All right, Gavin, do you have any opinions on germiest areas? Oh, I don't know whether I've got any opinions, Kathleen, but you know, there, there's a few maybe, but this is where we can, this is where it's so important. Um, we went through a COVID-19 pandemic all around the world and we heard this term high touch surfaces. And I went, really? You know, bed knobs and broomsticks and light switches, that was a Disneyland movie. We don't do Disney in the clean industry. We focus on risk assessments and we focus on science and we focus on real evidence of where, just like Kimberly said, there are areas that will have more germs, a higher risk of being, a, and I call these reservoirs, in the built environment than you'd even imagine. It's not just the high touch areas. Yes, we touch a lot of areas that helps in spreading germs through the transmission, but there are areas of germs in our built environment that people need to really focus on. And so what, what, what I do, and I challenge everyone, um, if you haven't started measuring, you better start measuring right now. Um, when I jump on a plane, I have my ATP meter and I sit there and I swab the, the, tray, tray, the, the, the tray table and the armrest and the flight attendant comes up and goes, you can't do that. I went, yeah, I can. And she said, what did you get? I said, look at this number. And she said, what does that number of 12,000 mean? I went, well, the plane's a crime scene. No, it means it's really dirty. And it, it's the way that we use the tools that we have in the toolboxes in the clean industry to engage in conversation. The way that we can start defining what may look clean, but actually isn't clean. So let's move away from just that visible, oh, it's clean, to actually measuring clean. And there's, there's many tools that we have um, that, that can actually measure levels of cleanliness. And so what I like to start with um, in all the facilities that, that, that we help we help through ISSA in our training programs and our consultancy programs is to really start with a floor plan. And I start with a floor plan by helping people identify what's the materials in that floor plan. So what in that room, you know, what are the types of services, the materials in the buildings? Um, and that helps you determine the appropriate cleaning products as well as the disinfectants and also the the equipment to be used to clean uh, to a level of health and safety. Uh, I like to do risk assessments and I'd, I'd really like to challenge everyone. You know, I think what we, I, if I look here, Kathleen, we've got about 100, 134 people on this call on this webinar today. I'd like to challenge people. How many of you do risk assessments? How often do you do risk, risk assessments? And can I help you with the risk assessments? Because that risk assessment approach is so important when it comes to using cleaning products that have ingredients, as well as disinfectants that have ingredients, as well as time. Time is our biggest enemy. So it's really important that we look at the risk based on a floor plan and we determine, determine the areas that have the highest risk of germs or contamination, that highest risk of transmission, and then clean a, a clean based on that risk assessment. And I also include in this, Kathleen, a traffic flow analysis. And I don't know how many people on the call do traffic flow analysis, where I sit in an airport, a school, a government building, a hotel, um, any, any other commercial building. And a traffic flow analysis, we look at the flow of people within the building to identify areas that are more likely to get dirtier, faster, or need more frequent disinfection. And I've actually done this with, you know, I've done this with stadiums, convention centers, hotels, schools, 
and airports and also commercial buildings, uh, office space. And I've actually been able to save them money in their budget because what they've been doing for the last 15 and 20 years hasn't changed. And I've been able to influence them that throughout the year of 12 months, we don't just, we don't continue cleaning in the same manner, the same way. We can change our cleaning processes as well as our disinfection based on the season, based on our risks. So what is it right now? It's allergy season. Allergy season means I've got pollen in, in the air here in Washington, D.C., where I live, but I've also got a high level of respiratory viruses circulating at the moment. And if you've just read the newspaper over the weekend, you'll see that northeast of the U.S. is having a lot of norovirus outbreaks. So I've got norovirus outbreaks, I've got allergens, allergies, and I've got respiratory viruses. All the cleaning companies and the facility managers in the buildings I'm working with at the moment is adjust your cleaning processes and protocols based on your risk assessment, which I've just outlined, based on your traffic flow analysis, look at your material assessment. And then the last thing I recommend, once you've done those three processes, when you've got information from that and you're looking at what is the best way to clean that area based on the budget limitations, the time, limit, time limitations as well as people, I would encourage everyone to conduct a cleaning needs survey. And what I mean by that, work with the, the people that own the building, work with the people that pay your, your contract, but also consult with the building users about their concerns and observations regarding cleanliness. Because it's not until it gets to a real critical failure that we go, oh my gosh, that restaurant was so dirty, I'm never going back. Or the school is so dirty and suddenly I've got lots of absenteeism. I've got all these kids sick. I've got school teachers sick and I've got a parent teacher association saying, what are you going to do about it? Let's not get to critical failure. Let's conduct a cleaning needs survey so that we engage all the users and the partners of that building and we help tell our cleaning story. And I don't think there's enough storytelling within our industry to explain what we actually do based on science and evidence. Yeah, and I'd like to um, add in to um, the good points that Gavin just made. Um, one of the things that I did as far as targeted cleaning um, in K through 12 environments, we actually work with school nurses to see if there were high numbers of student absenteeism in certain classrooms. And then we would have a blitz of certain areas. Now, that's not to say we didn't conduct our regular cleaning throughout the school systems, throughout the, the 27 other school facilities. But we also had a targeted um, kind of a hit team, if you will, to work with nurses to see where are these numbers spiking? And let's go in and see if we can't make a difference from our cleaning and sanitation, uh, sanitization, as well as disinfection in these areas. Um, in a lot of school districts, they also have portable trailers. And as we know, we get into air quality, air circulation, things of that nature as well. So I think that has to be a factor in your cleaning plan, as Gavin mentioned, so that you can look at the, the entire environment and see what's going to work. And he's absolutely you know, correct as far as taking these assessments. I saw someone was asking about assessment tools. Um, ISSA has a really good tool. There's others out there as far as third parties that you can look at. One of the other organizations I'm involved in is Healthy Green Schools and Colleges. They have an assessment tool, um, Green Seal. There's quite a number. So you, I would say as a leader, take it upon yourself to look at what are the, um, the critical checklists and certification resources and just, you know, take a team um, and go through at least one building. Start small so that you can see what success can look like. Thank you. Uh, next slide. So um, sometimes uh, facilities have specific budgets and maybe the people doing the numbers don't understand, you know, the importance of it. So how do you justify the um, need for increasing your frequency of cleaning and disinfecting? Um, Gavin? Yeah, that's a really good question, Kathleen. And I just want to start that um, 
cleaning and disinfecting based on science and evidence doesn't mean that you do it more often. It means that you do it better. And you know, I think a lot of us don't have conversations along the fact that you can have a dry clean and a wet clean. And I, and, and, and so to justify this process and to everyone on this, on this webinar, I do case studies. And I was just working in a children's hospital recently and I was watching them clean the bed rails and I was watching them clean the equipment and the floors. And I went, oh my gosh, why do you do it that way? Because we've always done it that way. And I said, well, let's, let's, let's have some fun with this. Let's start trying different ways to clean these bed rails with, say, a, a good microfiber cloth, a dry clean. And we measured it using an ATP meter. We went from 9,000 units to down to less than 30. Was that acceptable? Yes, it was. And what I was trying to show them is that by visualization, by showing the metrics, and, and we've published these case studies I can share with you, but, but show, by tracking what's invisible and making it visible, now that we've, we've actually moved the industry towards, towards being a trade and being essential. So I've really highlighted a lot of, you know, I try to do as many case studies as I can um, I want those case studies to be readily, readily accessible. Um, and I'll give you a, a good example. Um, I do a lot of work in nursing homes, uh, hospitals, uh, and then and just long-term care facilities. And they had a really sort of rigorous cleaning protocol on a recent one I did. Uh, again, a lot of healthcare acquired infections was a big problem. And what we did, we actually changed the protocols based on the equipment, the moths we were using. Uh, microfiber mops, microfiber cloths, and we changed some of the cleaning products. And what we, were tr we, were, what we, what we did over a 12-month period, we actually showed that within that budget that there was a higher patient satisfaction score as well as the satisfaction score from the staff, the nurses and the doctors. Uh, I've done another case study in, in some corporate offices and it's really interesting when I walk into a corporate office, I say, well, we're going to look at how that cleaning relates to indoor air quality. And as soon as I take my indoor air quality monitor into a corporate office and I'm trying to protect everyone, what's the first thing they tell me? Oh, well, the director, the boss, the CEO, he wants you to put that monitor in his office. I went, no, no, I thought we'd put it in this area where there's high traffic flow and everyone wants to, you know, that self-preservation protect themselves. So what we did in this corporate office, we looked at the frequency of cleaning um, and the fact that we were trying to tell everyone it's everyone's responsibility. It's not just the cleaning company that comes, you know, maybe once a day or once every two days. Everyone in this office has a responsibility to create a healthy and safe environment. So we introduced some disinfectant wipes for employees to use at their workstations. And this was a 12 month study. And over that 12 months, this particular company actually recorded a decrease in absenteeism, a decrease in sick leave. And then every month we ran a quick survey and we saw an increase in reported employee satisfaction of the workspace for very little money. There was no change in the budget. We just changed the tools, equipment and the way that we cleaned. Um, I've just come back from doing some work in a school district. The school district has a budget of about $5 million. Um, the way that they clean has not changed for the last 15 years. Uh, I interviewed uh, the teachers. I interviewed the, uh, the some of the students. I interviewed the teachers and also interviewed the cleaning workers. And it was really interesting. A lot of the cleaning workers had uh, skin allergies, um, skin irritations. They had had respiratory uh, infections over the past you know, 12 months. And I think a lot of it was related to the chemicals they were using in their cleaning products, but also the uh, you know, they were using terry cloth towels and other things. And we re replaced them with microfiber mops and cloths. What we've now seen in this school district now is that we've focused on the common rooms. We've focused on the common areas, the restrooms. We've seen that student attendance has improved. And we've seen there's been a decrease in reported cases of illness this year, such as the respiratory diseases like flu and colds. And I think that's really important. We've taken the same approach to hotels. 
Um, but the change that we've done in hotels, focusing on evidence-based cleaning practices, is that we've actually set up dashboards in the hotels. Um, and those dashboards were measuring certain uh, metrics throughout the hotel based on the level of cleanliness. And we have now seen that by visualizing the cleaning processes and their measurements, we're seeing, you know, just you know, people starting to mention cleanliness all the time to in, in this hotel. And we're seeing it in reviews on the web after people have stayed at this hotel. And they're now telling me that they believe they're seeing increased bookings and increased revenue based on the changes they've made from their cleaning protocols, but more importantly, using a dashboard. Yes, and what I'll add in, and I did see uh, that question pop in to the chat about vacuuming. And again, that goes back into looking at your equipment and making sure that you are using um, environmentally sound equipment. We actually did that um, back in the early 2000s at the University of Georgia. We were one of the first schools to go uh, full bore on a green cleaning um, transition um, and won quite a number of um, state, regional, and national awards. And we have been um, green cleaning um, as a business practice. It's not just a fad. It, there's something that we actually wrote into um, how we were going to care for our facilities. And um, we also implemented that in K through 12 schools in, in our district. And as far as justification, as Gavin mentioned, in the first year that we implemented um, our green cleaning and environmentally focused um, cleaning program, we reduced employee accidents by 35%. Worker comp cases went down over 60%. We were able to reduce our waste footprint because we took almost 250 traditional cleaning products and we moved it down to three, only three uh, green cleaning, environmentally sensitive products. And we introduced microfiber on all of our mops um, or the cloths that we use. Um, so the change is real and it became economically viable and we could sustain it because we were able to show the budget reduction um, from not having to, to, to spend extra money on products that didn't work, that did cause harm, not just to staff, but to our um, clients inside of the buildings. Um, but as, as Gavin had already mentioned, just looking at what's available, taking the time, we, we always say you want to see success. So we started with a pilot program. We started in one area of our campus, and that was five buildings. We couldn't even get through 60 days without the rest of the campus. And, and this is almost 400 other buildings, research labs, law libraries, hospitals, um, academic facilities, all say, we want this in our buildings as well. So we had to go full bore. So, and I think it's, it's very important to, uh, you can't change everything overnight, but if you can start a, a small pilot program, that will give you the justification to, to go forward and give you and your staff the confidence and your stakeholders can see um, that you're making a headway and you're, all, you're doing it all because you have public health at the forefront of what you're doing. You can measure and you can see what's working as far as your cleaning process, as far as the equipment that may or may not work. Get your distributors, get your vendors on board to assist you they will be more than happy to do so. Isn't this interesting, Kimberly, that um, the largest surface that we deal with in a building is the floor. And when, when we saw the, the, the World Health Organization, the federal government put out guidelines and recommendations for decreasing the risk of diseases like COVID-19, but we deal with many other diseases. When you go through those guidelines, where's the discussion about how to clean a floor? and infection prevention and control. And I kept saying to people, there are so many studies out there where germs live on floors, contaminants live on floors, toxic chemicals live on floors, there's allergens live on floors. And I think what Marvin's put in the chat here about vacuuming, vacuuming 
Last year, ISSA did 54 cleaning for health workshops around the country. And what we asked everyone to come when they came to those workshops was bring your favorite cleaning piece of equipment. You know, what's your favorite cleaning equipment? And everyone, the majority of people bought their vacuum cleaner. And I had so much fun with this. Okay, let's look at your vacuum cleaner. What does it do? How do you know it works the way it works? And then the last question was, when was the last time you cleaned your vacuum cleaner? Exactly. And I was like, what do you mean? I went, well, I've got my ATP meter here. I've got my UV <laughs> black light. I've got all the tools in the kit. Let's see how dirty your vacuum cleaner is. That was easy. That was the easy part. Now, how about when we spend 10 minutes and I'll show you how to clean a vacuum cleaner? Because, you know, there are published studies out there where this has happened in hotels. It's happened in convention centers. It's even happened in schools and airports. Norovirus. It's norovirus season right now. You've, it's in the papers. It's on the news right now. There's big outbreaks occurring around the US. Vacuum cleaners have pay, played a significant role in spreading norovirus. And if yes. you don't clean them after use, it's going to keep spreading. And we've. Uh, I, you know, I'd love to share case studies with people. They're actually published. But to show that how important it is to clean your vacuum cleaner, clean your bucket. Oh, my gosh, I use a mop. How do I clean the mop? And and and, and these are the this, these are the this is why it's so important that we have apprenticeship programs and trade trade and we consider ourselves essential and as a trade because every person that belongs to a trade has to clean and maintain their equipment. Remember when I said that was the germiest place? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, sounds like there's some good consensus. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, another sponsor message. At Innova Nanojet Technologies, we specialize in developing ultrafine droplet spray systems for ultrafast cleaning indoor air, setting new standards in clean and healthy living for homes and public indoor spaces. Effectively remove airborne pollutants in your space using only water. Our nanojet spray can be used around people and doesn't cause any damage to sensitive materials or electronic devices. Visit our website to discover how you can achieve clean air for life with Innova Nanojet Technologies. Okay, our next slide. Um, I know it's come up before, but we were talking about um, indoor air quality and how um, cleaning and disinfecting affects the air we breathe. Um, besides vacuuming, um, are there any other uh, tips, HVAC solutions? Uh, who wants to go first? I can go first on, on this and, and um, I know Gavin is going, that's one of his specialties. He can definitely help with that. But as far as the things that we've done in both our higher education and K through 12 in the past is have a preventative maintenance plan in place. That's number one. When was the last time you actually had a preventative maintenance plan so that you knew exactly what, what is the cycle for changing out the air filters, making sure that you have the correct type of filter for the area that you need to check. Portable trailers uh, or co learning cottages have a different need. They have a higher need. Um, research labs, classrooms, hospitals, they have a higher need in some of those. So making sure that the vendors on board, because we had a contract, and so we had to make sure that the contractor had the right spec for the, the area and with the ASHRAE standards, making sure that they were following those. We actually put this into our um, computer-aided work order management system so that we could track when the filter changes took place. And if there was a problem, we would send our own staff. Now, outside of um, HVAC, you can look at various types of um, nano-driven technologies. Um, there are um, other types of equipment that you can use, um, on-site generation. There's a lot of different technologies out that are very good. And it's a matter of working with your your business partners, your distributors, and your vendors to try these technologies. Again, pilot in a particular area and see what is working. You can measure and then see what you can afford um, and start small. 
I know the school districts have a re really restricted budget, so that's why I keep trying to drive that home. You know, pile in an area and then go forward as it works. No, I, th I think that's absolutely brilliant, Kimberly. This is so important um, in the fact that it took a global pandemic to say, for the clean industries to go, oh, indoor air quality, yeah, that might be important. And I think if you're in the US and you have a, a cell phone like this one um, and you go to the weather app, my weather app on my phone tells me the air quality for outdoors, but I'm not outdoors, I'm inside. And what we don't have throughout our community, our society, our industry, is good measurements of indoor air quality inside buildings. So one of the things I would recommend to everyone is demonstrate. Demonstrate our expertise, our knowledge, our ability to measure indoor air quality. Um, it's not about, oh, I'll just open this window and increase the ventilation or, or you know like kimberly was mentioning i'll go and you know change the hvac system and crank it up or i'll change the MERV filter to another MERV filter it's not that's not it it's about understanding that we can measure baseline and get what is the indoor air quality in a particular space uh in the indoor built environment and then we can come up with a science evidence-based solution to that and 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 i would say this to everyone right now uh, at ISSA, um, for our members, we are working with companies that produce and, and, and sell indoor air quality monitors, but we're also working with them to get, you know, 30 day, try before you buy, 30 day, just go and see if you can use the indoor air quality monitor as part of your business strategy or business process. So please reach out to us because we want to see more indoor air quality monitors out there. I have you know, a number here in my uh, in my house right now. And when I see something change, whether it might be an increase in volatile organic compounds, VOCs, or I might see an increase in particle counts, I, then I can change based change what's happening in that, that space, that room, based on my measurements. And so it's really important that we as an industry use the tools like indoor air quality monitors we demonstrate our expertise and knowledge. I, you know, again, pro, you know, provide to your customer, take one of these devices, the indoor air quality monitor, and just try it, just set it up and see whether that indoor air quality where you're cleaning right now or working now is acceptable. Uh, educate them on the health risks. Uh, it's not just infectious disease, it's particles, it's chemicals, it's con contaminants, it's allergens. We saw this last year when, when I woke up in Washington, D.C., and all of Washington, D.C. was awash in smoke that was coming from the fires, the forest fires in Canada. I didn't know I breathed air from Canada. I had no idea. But what what, what we had then was, what do we do? Because that, that smoke air, which we're going to see again this spring, this summer, was coming in indoors. And we were seeing real measurements show what the risk is for those that may have asthma or uh, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So there are people in our community that we have to protect. So again, provide evidence. I would also help you with case studies um, and then work with the customer to identify um, whether monitoring indoor air quality is part of what they want to do in their, their building and, 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 and show them that through a cost benefit analysis, through leveraging users, public sentiments, and that you can actually build and bring in indoor air quality monitors as part of your cleaning processes in any building. And I know for a fact that as I've traveled around the country and internationally, and I've started to use indoor air quality monitors, the first thing anyone says to me in a building, it's the CEO, it's the director, it's the boss goes, can you put it in my office? Well, I wasn't really focusing on how we clean your office. I was more focusing on all the workers out there and how to protect them. But that's what happens. Every school I go to, it's the principal wants an indoor air quality monitor first in his office. Um, when I, I was putting them, setting some up just recently in a hotel and the hotel said, no, I want one in my general manager's office. So as we start to educate our, our customers and the users of buildings that we actually have devices, indoor air quality monitors, that can actually show a return on investment, return on investment by actually measuring and showing real data. 
And then we as cleaning professionals can help with our processes and our protocols, our products um, and our equipment, manage that to ensure that that air is safe. And it's so, so important. The last thing, I've just finished doing a study with um, police departments and we put the indoor air quality monitors in the rooms where the shift changes. They have three shift changes every 24 hours. And the numbers were just going off the roof. It was just showing that during the shift change, the crowding in the room was not safe. But after the shift change was finished, it took about 30 minutes and it just came back down to normal levels. But more importantly, why were those numbers increasing? Because they were wearing their bulletproof vests and all their equipment they've been outside in into that small room with pretty poor, inadequate ventilation, and we created an unsafe environment. So we actually could sit down and come up with a solution that worked. Did it cost them any more money? No, it didn't. It was the fact that they could see the measurements and act upon them. And this is so exciting for me right now is that the more measurement, the more, more measurements, the more data we're getting, it's leading us to be more essential as an industry. And then we're, we're moving towards being um, being more of a trade than just a convenience. Next slide, please. All right. Uh, here's a chat question. Um, does the topic of cleaning for health ever come up in your among your staff or other people in your building? Uh, feel free to... Um, answer in our chat section. Um, but um, I did see a question come up, um, Kimberly and Gavin, in our Q&A. Someone was asking about um, measles outbreaks. That has been in the news lately. Gavin, you touched on norovirus. Are there any specific um, tactics you can use for disinfecting if you know that there's a measles outbreak in your area? Yeah, Kathleen, great question. Um, read the label. Um, I, I, it's, I'm, I'm about 56 years old or thereabouts, Kathleen. And I, the biggest problem I have with all our cleaning products, I can't read the font on the label. And that's a problem. I know that our manufacturers make our products to meet legislation and requirements, but the information on the label is unusable. So I use QR codes. I make, I make videos all the time, read the label and use the cleaning product or the disinfectant the way that it was designed to be used. And, and, and so it's so important we do that. Um, I know dilutions are really challenging, but if you buy a concentrated product, it has to be diluted. Then come up with a process, you know, take your cell phone and make a quick video this, everyone, everyone in the company, this is how we dilute the product based on the way that we, we're spending money on this product based on the way the product is designed to be used. And, and I can go out and I can use my pH, my, my pH strips, I can test, I can show when the dilutions are wrong. I can see damage in buildings when products have not been diluted properly. Um, I know Sharon Cole put a, a, a question in the, in the chat there, Kathleen, about different pieces of equipment like microfiber it's really critical to understand that the magic properties microfiber is like a magnet it has electrostatic properties but you can only wash microfiber with microfiber and when you wash microfiber with cotton or other materials it loses those magic properties and most of the microfiber that i buy and i'm pretty sure that kimberly has you can wash up to 500 times and you, as long as you follow the directions on from the manufacturer, wash microfiber with microfiber, it's going to last you a long, long time, and it's worth the investment. Um, and I can, and I'll, you know, as, as both Kim and I have done this before, we've demonstrated the power of a good cleaning cloth or mop, preventing cross contamination, preventing movement of germs, preventing movement of chemicals and toxic toxic chemicals or contaminants. Really, really important. So. It, it, you know, again, it's so important that we we standardize. I'd love to see like I'd love to see a toolkit the size of a shipping container and say, this is how we clean a hotel. This is how we clean a school and this is how we clean an airport and this is how we clean a, an office building. And we train to what's in the shipping container. Unfortunately, our industry structured that it's hard to do that through procurement processes, but I'm sure Kimberly and I are really focused right now going, no, let's go back to standardized cleaning approaches 
that work. And so that you know from your cleaning company, when you talk to the facility manager, what you're what they're paying for, you can actually tell your cleaning story that what I'm doing is evidence-based, it's based on science, and it just works. Yeah, great points. And I'll just add, there's a couple of things on there. Um, as far as writing into our, we have a building service worker academy and building service worker was a title that our staff wanted instead of custodians. So it's a mandatory new hire. It used to be two weeks, but we, because of time and function and restraints, we have it down to one week. But one week mandatory new employee building service worker academy where they are taught all of the products they're gonna use, all of the equipment that they're gonna use, what's the proper process, what are the soft skills, what are the HR things they need to know about insurance and all of that. But everyone may not have that luxury to do, but you better have some type of orientation and a standardized process. And then that can help you on the long run with reducing your worker injuries, reducing accidents, making sure that the output, your product, the employees that you have, the output that they're producing is consistently good every day, right? But we utilize dilution control systems as part of our process. We use a green cleaning contract that is standardized for university operations. So even if it's an outside contractor coming in, before the contract is awarded, they have to comply with the standards that our cleaning leaders have established as this is what works. So again, standardizing your processes, treating what you do as a profession because it is, creating the language and the expectations of what the product output should be helps you legitimize who you are, helps you to identify why your budget needs to be the way it is and why you can charge, which you can quite frankly need to charge if you're outside contract. Oh, I, I love that, Kimberly. Be able to tell your cleaning story because I think it's fascinating. I love seeing how people clean. And then I go back and go, oh, the person who's paying your contract, your bill, the money, they don't know. They haven't seen this. You've got to show them. Show them how you clean their building. It's so cool. All right. Um, we're going to skip on ahead um, to the Q&A section. So um, I do have some that were already listed. And if anyone else wants to put some in the chat area, we will go to about 10 minutes after two. But after that, we have to log off. But um, I have someone asking about what do you think is going to be the future of cleaning and disinfection? Are there going to be like any new technologies or thought processes or? Yeah, this is great, Kathleen. Um, you know, my, my career history was in biological weapons and I was an epidemiologist for years at CDC. And that whole being a disease detective was making the the invisible become visible. There are tools now in the industry that we should be using that measures the level of cleanliness. There are more tools I know that are coming down the pipeline this year, very soon, such as special lights that are going to be able to highlight chemical compounds, contaminants on a surface. They're going to be able to show allergens. They're going to be able to show bacteria and viruses through the illumination of light. And this is really important that, that, that we don't just clean based on, oh, it looks visibly clean. We base we we clean based on measurement. And those tools coming out, I know Kim and I have seen these tools. We're excited by them. And we want to ensure that they're not cost prohibitive, but we actually, as an as a as I to say, as a trade association, trade association works with our members to work out how we get these tools in your hand so you can then demonstrate them to the customer maybe through a rental agreement, a try before you buy agreement, 30 days try, or some sort of leasing agreement without putting too much money out there, but actually show the value of these tools that allow you to measure cleanliness. Right, and one of the things that we are looking at um, is, is a Casper pro product 
continuous air and surface pathogen reduction, um, in addition to some of the other things that we're already doing. Um, so I think that's why organizations like ISSA is so important. You can stay on the front line of what's going on and know what are going to be the technologies that people are trying and that are working. And as Gavin said, you don't want to have to spend a whole lot of money because most definitely school districts and, and, and colleges and universities, they don't have that money anyway. But again, having a great partnership with your distributors and vendors to maybe come in and allow you to use the equipment for a, a, a specified amount of time in one of the areas, but you need to know what area you want to try that in, right? And again, that goes back to your assessment. Don't put it in a nice clean area, put it in your dirtiest area. That's how you really can tell if it's going to work. So I think that's very important. I think another thing that is gonna be crucially important in our field is the staffing and to make sure that you have a training program because we know staffing is such a challenge, right? So you can't get beyond that. If you know that you only have you know, 10 people and you're trying to, to clean uh, 27 schools, you got to use technology and mechanized equipment. There's no other way. And as the leaders, um, you're going to have to go to your school boards, your other powers that be, and you're going to have to get them on board to help you pay for equipment because you don't have the people to do that. So I definitely want to put that out there um, as far as a real problem, a real challenge that we have to face in our industry. Well, I, I agree with you, Kimberly. I really see the future as being apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. I see workforce development programs. I think, mm -hmm. you know, actually acknowledging that we are no longer an industry that cleans in the hours of darkness and mm -hmm. you just have to travel. I, I travel a lot, but you, I see cleaning professionals all the time during daylight hours and now being able to give them the knowledge and skills and abilities is so important. So I, you know, we, we've just seen this year launched in the United Kingdom, um, in England, Wales, Scotland, a program that talks about, that that has actually launched about a, a, an apprenticeship program for cleaning professionals. We've seen it in healthcare, but I think that's going to expand. But more, I think it's going to be so important for hotels, for schools, for airports, for office buildings that you are trained as an apprentice for that specific purpose in the chemistry, the ingredients we use, the equipment we use, the tools we use, the processes we use, and that's coming. If it's not, if it's not, if you if you know you haven't heard about it, you've heard about it today from Kimberly and I, it is coming <laughs> and I'm so excited about it. I have a couple questions about um where people can go to uh find out to get a, a risk assessment. So um anyone has any ideas for that one. Um, and also if there's tools other than ADT that can help with cleanliness. I'll start with the risk assessment if that's okay, Kathleen. Mm -hmm. um, a floor plan. If you are cleaning any building, get a floor plan. And then you go to the, the facility manager, oh, I don't have a floor plan. Then I go over to the wall and go, here's the evacuation plan on the wall in case there's an emergency. Went, I want a copy of that because that shows me the floor plan. And then I go through that floor plan and I list all the materials in the rooms. And, uh, you know, are they hard surfaces, porous surfaces, soft surfaces? What are they made of? I list all these things because even some of those hard surfaces, they're still porous. And I list all the surfaces I have to deal with. Is it is it a room with carpet or a room with, you know, hard floors? And I put that in the room. Then I use my coloring in pencils. I use the traffic light system. And I start to bring in time. How long does it take to clean that room based on the materials? And I'll color it red, yellow, green. And I then show this to the, to the customer. This is part of my first step in my risk assessment based just on what's sitting in the room. Everyone can do that. Um, you know, everyone can go and take the floor plan and start coloring it in based on time, materials, um, and, and just the, even the space of the room. Uh, again, going back to the vacuum clean, uh, the, the vacuuming question, is it carpet? How long does it take to vacuum? How often am I going to vacuum? So I use that on a floor plan. I want, I want, I want to encourage everyone to get floor plans of where you work now and start coloring in those areas 
based on the time and the materials and how long it takes there. That's the very first step. If you start there, then we can go back and look at the equipment you're using, the chemical products you're using, whether you need to disinfect, how, what level of training your people need to go into that room and clean it so it's healthy and safe. I agree with everything he said. And there's so many resources. Like I just pulled this one off of, <laughs> you can't see it because my screen is blurred, but this is off the ISSA website, right? Uh, there are resources out there. Do a Google search to help you uh, figure out how you need to uh, begin your risk assessment. And there, we're here. ISA can make our information available to you as well. All right. All right. I, it's past two, so I think we're going to wrap up. But I wanted to thank both of our panelists, Gavin and Kimberly, and also to thank our sponsors, Dial and Nanojet. I appreciate everyone who came in and took some time off from their busy days to join us. And remember to look in your email for a copy of the rest of the uh, webinar and also go to cmmonline.com to find it online. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Yeah. Thank you.